السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا ابن رسول الله ما شاء الله لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم حسن الله ونعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير ربي شرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفكه قولي أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله قاسم الجبارين مبير الظالمين مدرك العاربين والصلاة والسلام والتحية والإكرام على النبي الأمي المكي المدني الهاشمي الذي سمي في السماوات بأحمد وفي العرضين بأب القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الأطيبين الأطهرين سيما أولهم أمير المؤمنين وآخرهم بقية الله في الأرضين روحي وارواه العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفدا ورحمة الله على محبيهم ومواليهم وشيعتهم مجمعين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ملعونين أما بعد all praise due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no one who is Ahman and no one who is Ahim. We had begun a discussion yesterday in regards to a hadith from Imam al Sajjad alayhi salam, where the Imam explains the effects of certain sins upon an individual and very specifically he mentions specific effects yesterday we spoke about the reduction of one's life expectancy and there were six things that the Imam mentioned there today I want to look at another portion of that hadith where the Imam says with the nubility that the sins of a person that reduce their risk or push away their allotted amount. You see, rizq is that thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has proportioned for every single human being. Whether we like it or not, we're getting it. Uh, but there are certain sins that that rizq that is apportioned for us may be taken away. You know, so many times we come across narrations where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in Hadith Qudsi or other places, He's saying that, Son of Adam, you should know that I have apportioned for you that which you will, uh, your rizq for the day, for the year, for whatever the time frame is. So don't worry about it. Don't run around morning and night forgetting me, chasing that rizq. No, make me the priority. I'm paraphrasing multiple versions of uh, the same subject matter that appear in different uh, communications of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prioritize me over all other things and I will give you the dunya, uh, rizq within the dunya and rizq within the akhirah more than you can even imagine. But if you prioritize chasing that risk because you think that it is from your own effort that you're going to get that and it's nothing to do with me then I will make you run around like an animal morning and night chasing after that until at the end of the day you are broken and I will still give you that which I was going to give you in the first place so that Allah that is saying, look, your rizq is chasing you. It's coming for you. I will give it to you whether you like it or not. You know, it's that one thing where we can't get away from it. Allah has apportioned for us the rizq that we're going to get. Yes, I have to go out. I have to work. I have to do all of these things. But it's not about worry. Allah says in the hadith of Mi'raj to the Holy Prophet, he says that, uh, Oh Ahmed, I'm shocked at three groups of my people. And the third group, he says, I'm shocked at that Abd of mine that knows that I have provided him his rizq 
from the moment he was born until now. I've never let him stay naked. I've never let him go hungry. I've never let him starve. I've never let him uh, be, you know, in a position where he has no money. I've given him all of this rizq. He says, I'm shocked at that person that knows that I've given him all of this. We do this. We have that, we pay that lip service. Yes, this rizq is from Allah. This is all from Allah. He says, I'm shocked at that person that knows that I have given him, knows that I have provided for him thus far, but still stays awake at night worrying about tomorrow. He was worrying about tomorrow. What am I going to do? How am I going to pay my bills? Oh, I'm having a child now. What? What? No, oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so many times in the Holy Quran, He says that I will give to you. You know, so many times people go into, won't get married. Oh, no, no, I haven't established myself. I need to get this. Yes, that that is all well and good. You know, having some level of uh, stability within one's life. But at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that don't worry about risk. I will give it to you. I will fill your uh, laps with risk. The same with children. It says your children bring their own risk. You do not feed them. You're just the, the conduit. It's coming from Allah, it's not decreasing from you. And so when the human being understands this, and understands where Allah says in the Holy Quran, min la yahtasib, that Allah will give to that person from a place where he did not even accept it. And then the next I say, وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ the one who trusts in God, he is enough for him. Once you have tawakkal ala Allah, then come hell or high water. You are steadfast on that trust. That doesn't mean that we sit back and we're like, okay, Allah, give it to me, give me my risk, give me everything like you gave to Maryam. No. You put in a bit of effort. The whole point of these hadith is that. A person needs to understand, this is coming my way. I just need to put in enough effort to gain it. Not make my morning and night about it to the detriment of my religion. You know, people, uh, I said uh, the day before yesterday that, you know, people get up and say, you know, go out there, let's get it. Today's the day. All these motivational uh, speakers and these life coaches. And now, you know, it's, it's the common thing. Everyone's everyone's a life coach and a motivational speaker, you know. And yeah, go on. Today's the day. Get out there. Let's get it. And even loads of many Shias, they're talking about it. You know, I'm up at 4 a.m. and But... You know, up at 4 a.m. to start your business and do all of that. But did you spare a thought for God? Why not influence the people towards God? Let's do something for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not that Allah needs it, but for ourselves. So that risk is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has apportioned for me. It says, put in the effort, but don't forget me. Don't forget me. The moment you make sh make the effort outweigh your remembrance of God, that's a downward spiral. So that risk, the point of giving you this whole introduction was, that risk is something that is coming your way. It is so easy to gain it. Allah is sending it to you every single thing, every single place. He's like, no, I'm going to give it to you. This is it's, it's all there. But there are certain sins that a person can commit that even that most abundant of blessing, uh, blessings of God, i.e. rizq, and rizq isn't just food or wealth, it's health and all of these other uh, things, can be restricted from a person, can be removed from a person. And Imam Sajjad speaks about it in this hadith. So what is the first thing that will remove the, reduce the rizq of a person, or reduce the lot of a person? He says, is harul iftikar. The first thing that will reduce your risk is telling people 
about your poverty or to make yourself out poor in front of people. So one is, I've hit hard times. And now wherever I sit, oh, it's so difficult, oh, New Jersey is so expensive, oh, I can't make ends meet, oh, I'm having to work this many jobs, oh, I'm doing... It says, no. Don't go around telling people about your poverty. You know, one of the companions of Imam Masad that comes to visit him, the Imam is sitting, he comes in, he says, uh, Imam, I'm, you know, I'm struggling, I'm in debt, I need some financial help. So Imam gets up, he's with people, Zahirin. He gets up and the Imam gives him, the, takes him aside, gives him some money. As he walks away, Imam says to him, listen, don't ever open your secrets out in front of people again. So it'll, it'll lead to your humiliation. It'll lead to you becoming humiliated and having no izzah, no honor in front of the people. Allah has made you aziz. Oh, the Holy Quran, when he talks about the human being, he says, look, don't lower yourself. As a human being, who are you? Allah has made you aziz. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has dignified you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has dignified you. لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We gave dignity to the sons of Adam, to the children of Adam. Don't lower yourself. An individual is there, you know, you're sitting around telling people, oh, I've got this problem, oh, you know, I've got this difficulty in my life. Or at times it happens that an individual had a difficult time, but now that the ease has come, they still make themselves out to be poor. Or they live like a poor person. That's even worse. I.e. they live as a poor person to the detriment of their deen and their dunya. They can live a more comfortable life. They can make create a better life for their wife and their children and their parents. But because of that fear of the poverty again, they, they hold back. And there this person has now switched over into another disease of the soul and that is being a miser. And when a person starts to hold on to it, that opens a whole new can of worms in regards to one's spiritual development. So a person who is always telling people about his poverty or then one who makes himself out to be poor in front of other people. Imam Sajjad says, don't do it. You know, you have the wealth, then don't act like you're poor. You know, and we're so afraid at times, certain communities we go to, it's like, oh, I can't buy a nice car because of Nazar. You know, this Nazar, it, let's, you know. <laughs> yes, there is the Hasad, there is this Nazar, we have an idea of it. But we are more afraid of the creation than the creator. Now I won't go and buy something nice because people are going to start looking and I'm going to lose it. And in reality, what are we showing? Showing our attachment to the dunya. I don't want to lose this special thing that I have or this special car so I always take the beat up car to the masjid. There's, a, there's an element, there's a point where a person becomes a miser and there's a point where a person is being extravagant. Both are haram. If I'm doing fulfilling my wajibat, my khums and my zakat and giving sadaqah and helping people, the wajibat that I have to do, there's no harm in me having something nice. And yes, if people are coming, recite Ma'a was attained, recite Surah Falak, Surah An Nas. But this abject fear that people live in. Because of that, we don't like calling people to our homes. So we deprive ourselves of that barakah and that mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because of this abject fear, I don't want to have a better, get a better life for me and my children. Because of that, I create no end of issues within my marital life, no end of issues within my friend circle. Because of that, I become the butt of jokes of people. But of every joke, people are making jokes about my miserliness. You see, that insan that was aziz, that insan that was dignified is now becoming the butt of the joke for what? 
So the first thing that angers Allah such that he reduces that person's lot is one that goes around and talks about how poor they are and starts to tell people. The second thing that reduces one's rizq and the second and the third are linked. The Imam says, When no more anil atama, sleeping at night, having not prayed your namaz e isha. And then the next one, wa an salatil ghadat, and missing your salatil fajr. Al ghada is the time from the time of fajr until sunrise, until fajr is qada. So these two, although all of the namaz is a person that does nisyan, forgets his salah, doesn't pray salah, Allah begins to reduce their risk. Allah makes, their, it makes it more difficult for them. That's there. But especially these two. Other narrations also speak about the time of Maghrib. So Maghrib and Isha were talking like around the same time. Because that's where the heavens open and the angels begin to come down. At the time of Fajr, just before Fajr, as soon as you wake up, that time of Sahar that we usually reserve only for eating, but actually it is the time of Dua, it is the time of uh, praying towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That time of Sahar is at the time when the doors of the heavens are open, the time of Fajr, at the doors of heaven are open. Ask Allah for your risk, Allah will give you risk. But when the angels come down and they find this Abd, Asleep, it just goes back just over and over. They come over and over. Come on, I've got your risk for the day. Here's your risk for the day, and the person's not ready to receive. Eventually, those angels stop coming. And Allah says, This individual that has stopped praying to me, you know, oh, no, I've got an exam tomorrow, I've got to sleep, I'm going to sleep before Fajr. Uh, sorry, I'm going to sleep before Maghrib. Oh, I'm not going to pray Salat al Isha, falling asleep. And then Maghrib, if I get up for if I get up for Fajr, uh, then I'm going to be too tired for school or for work. So I just you know sleep through it. It will reduce in your rest in the barakah in your life. If you've got I don't know economic issues financial problems, uh, economic, financial, same thing, marital issues, issues with your family, issues with your children, issues with your own self, your own morality, your own akhlaq, you don't like the person that you've become. If you have issues with being able to cry during Masai, if you have issues with body odor, with bad breath, I'm not joking. <laughs> there are multiple things that Salatul Layl, praying at the time of Sahar, doing A'mal just before the time of Fajr and during Fajr, all of these things are removed. Physical, spiritual, social problems are all eradicated from the life of a person. Recites Quran at the time of Sahar, it removes a rust from the heart of an individual. Recite Salatul Layl, it will increase in your risk, it will increase in your lifespan, it will reduce your body odor, it will make your breath smell good. Well, all of these things, it will give you hikmah, it will give you insight. And then waking up early at that time, when everyone else is asleep, and you know that I can't rush off to work, I can't rush off and do this now. Now is the time, as we mentioned the day before yesterday, for stillness, for calmness. I'm still, and that gives me clarity. That's my time for munajat with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The same for the night before I sleep because sleep is the brother of death. If I prayed my Maghrib and Isha and when I sleep my soul leaves my body and Allah doesn't want to return it back to the body. At least I've left this world having prayed my Salah at least. So these two sleeping and not waking up to pray or 
not reciting Salat al-Isha, and then not waking up for Fajr. Both of these will reduce uh, one's rizq, one's lot from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next thing the Imam says um, is not appreciating the blessings and downplaying that which Allah has given you. So say someone comes to me and says, oh, you know, it's a really nice car. I say, oh, yeah, yeah it's, you know, it's nice and stuff. It's all I could afford really. Otherwise, I, I, could have, I would really ideally want something like yours. Oh, mashallah, your child recited so well. Yeah, alhamdulillah, it was okay. A little bit out of tune, you know, and he doesn't really, and he forgot some of the lines. I mean, <laughs> parents like this. Um, so people come in and say, oh, you look really good. Yeah, you know, I'm okay. Just, you know, I just wish I could, you know, I don't know, lose a few pounds. But you look healthy. Yeah, I know, just... MashaAllah, your wife cooks really nice. Yeah, Alhamdulillah, you know, but I wish she was. So all of these na'mah that I have from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every single moment, every single chance I get, I'm just downplaying them, not appreciating the benefits that I have. All of these blessings that God has given me, I downplay it, I don't appreciate it. He says, okay, no problem, I'll just take it away. I'll just take it away from you. You, know, you, didn't, you didn't appreciate the job that I gave you, the job that helped you out of this rut. Now you're still looking further. You're not appreciating the situation that you're in right now. You're not appreciating my blessings, no problem. I'll take it away from you. You start downplaying that which Allah has given you. Start looking at other people's, ah, oh, you know, like, no, it's the wrong way. You are going to, ah, oh, God, you know, why are you, you know, why am I in this situation? No, God, I want better. I want, give me more, give me more. It's the wrong way. God himself has given us the answer. He says, look, if you've got something good in your life, you want to improve it? You want more of it? Simple solution. Thank me and I'll give you more. Thank me. Don't downplay my blessings. Don't not appreciate what I have given you. The moment you show a lack of appreciation, If you do kufran na'am, then know that my adab is shadeed. Severe adab that I'm sending your way. I'll take it away from you one by one. You won't even know what happened. So the one that downplays the na'mah that he has been given, Allah will reduce his overall rizq. Take it away from him. And then the last thing that the imam says, the one that is complaining, it's linked to the one before, is complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about the situation that they are in or about the lot that they have been allotted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're complaining. Oh God, why did you do this? Why have you given this person this? Why didn't you give me this? That jealousy. Whereas... The narration says the mu'min is not jealous. The mu'min does ghibta. If he sees another believer with a better car, sees another believer with a better life, sees another believer with a more happy home life, he says, Ya Allah, give him more and also give me some of that. That's ghibta. He doesn't complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're complaining. If we could overcome that, if we could overcome that, it's a huge hurdle in our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I could get into the habit of not complaining about anything. You now, there are many stories of Arafa that are going through my head, but we just don't have time to go into them, of how Arafa 
and people that would come to them for advice say, how is it that you achieved this? How is it? They said, okay, look, stop complaining. Just don't complain. Don't complain about the situation you're in. Don't complain about the way. We complain about everything. I come out, oh, it's too hot. One day I come out, oh, it's raining again. Another day I come out, oh, it's freezing. Oh, the traffic on the way to work. Oh, the traffic on the way uh, home from work. Oh, the noise my children are making. Oh, the mess that's in my house. Oh, it's never ending. Poor well, guys, even when we come to the masjid, we, you know, the place that we should be. Ah, oh, the niyaz today wasn't no good. Ah, <laughs> oh, this person looked at me funny. Oh, this person, you know, parked in my spot. Oh, this person doesn't end. We complain about so much. So many of the stories of the Arafah. The first step is don't complain. Just be happy with what Allah has given you. Don't complain. Because that's the first step to total acceptance and submission to Allah. If the slave can accept and have trust in God. Say, I know that God will not do wrong by me. Regardless of the ups and the downs in my life, I know that God will never do wrong by me. He's always got my best interest at heart. Don't complain. The last thing that reduces and removes the risk from the life of a person is that complaining to Allah about the situation that Allah has placed in that one's life. And Karbala is that place where all that difficulty, all those trials, all those problems, not one complaint, not one complaint. You have a young boy, Naqasim, coming to Aba Abdullah, coming, kissing his uncle's hands and feet. Oh, uncle, give me permission to go out and fight. And Maqati say, Lam yazal yuqabbil ar-rajalayhi wa yaday. He was constantly kissing the hands and the feet of his uncle. Or another boy that the Maqatil don't mention his name says he rode out. His father had just been killed. He's not from Bani Hashim. He rides out. The army say we were waiting for him to recite. The army of Yazid was saying we were waiting for him to recite his rajas. See how he introduces himself. Who is this young boy? Instead, he rides out saying, Amiri Husaynun wa ni'mal Amir. Says, Hussein is my Amir, and what a great Amir leader he is. Says, instead of saying his name, Amiri Husaynun wa ni'mal Amir, there's not a complaint on the lips of anyone in Karbala. He's coming out there saying, I wonder who this boy is, Sururu Fuad al Bashir al Nadir. Hussein is that part of the heart of Rasulullah, the peace of the heart of Rasulullah. Ali wa Fatima Walida, still this boy won't introduce himself. Ali and Fatima are his parents. Wahal ta'lamun lahu bin Nadir. What greater blessing is there? What greater sharaf is there? Than this, that he is the son of Ali and Zahra. The boy doesn't introduce himself. He doesn't worry about himself. When Zainab is asked by Ibn Ziyad that how is it that you perceived what Allah did to your brother, she turns towards him and says, Ma ra'aytu illa jamila. Zainab saw nothing but beauty, O Ibn Ziyad. That beauty that Zainab sees is someone like Sa'id. 
Sayyid ibn Abdullah that stands in front of his Imam as the arrows come towards Aba Abdullah. He runs left and right while his Imam leads the Salah. When he finishes over 14 arrows in his body, he falls to the ground. Imam Hussein takes his head in his lap. He says, Sayyid, is there anything that Hussein can do for you? He says, yes, answer one question for me. Oh, Yabna Rasulillah says, what is it? He says, our fate, have I been loyal to you? Have I fulfilled this oath of loyal to you, loyalty to you, Ya Aba Abdullah? Not a single complaint in Karbala. All of them drowning in the love of Allah. Those tears that fell from the eyes of Abu Abdullah, they're not tears of complaint. Not tears of complaint. Tears are natural. He holds the body of the six month old child in his hands looks towards the heavens, he says, My Lord, this is easy for Hussein to bear, knowing that you are watching. Even when he goes to bury him and he holds him to his chest and he's crying, and Allah, for the first time a voice comes from the heavens, the angels call out, Hussein, leave the child. We have wet nurses waiting for him in heaven. There's nowhere where there's a complaint. He comes to the body of his Ali Akbar. Ala dunya ba'dakal afa. My son, what pleasure is there left in this dunya after you? But at the same time, Hussein is drowned in the love of Allah. He comes to the body of Abbas. His brother lies on the ground. Says Abbas. Now Hussein's back has been broken, Abbas. After you, Abbas, Hussein's resolve has been broken, Abbas. Comes to the broken body of Qasim. As he tries to lift him, he says, Azza wallah ala ammik. How difficult it is for you, for your uncle, O Qasim, that you called him. And he tried to answer you, but by the time he answered you, it was too late. Qasim's body trampled under hooves of horses. Having seen all of that, his body covered in blood. On one side, the blood of his Ali Akbar. On the other side, the blood of his Ali Asghar. On one side, the blood of his Abbas. The blood of his Qasim. He mounts on his horse for the last time. Looks towards the heavens. Ilahi taraktu l'khalqatur ran fi hawaka. Wa aytamtu l'ayala likay araka. وَيْقَطَّعْتَنِي بِالْحُبِّ إِرَبًا إِرَبًا لِمَهَلَ الْفُؤَادُ إِلَى السِّوَاكَ My Lord, I've left the whole of creation for your sake. I've orphaned my children so that I may see you. And even if the swords were to come and cut me to pieces, لِمَهَلَ الْفُؤَادُ إِلَى السِّوَاكَ My heart would turn to none but you. There is not a single complaint in Karbala. Even after Karbala, there's no complaint. Some cry for 35 years for that loss, but that crying isn't complaining. Sajjad cried for 35 years. Every time he would see an animal be slaughtered, he would say to the butcher, say, did you give this animal water? Says, yes, Ibn Rasulullah, we are Muslims, we give animals water before they are slaughtered. He says, have you made sure the knife is sharp? Says, yes, Ibn Rasulullah, the knife is sharp. We don't want to give more uh, 
pain to this animal. So we make sure the knife is sharp with a single strike, with a single cut, and this animal's pain ends. Sajjad would look towards that animal being slaughtered, would turn towards Karbala and say, Oh my father, here they give animals water, they make sure the knives are sharp so that only one cut is inflicted upon the, uh, the animal. But you, oh Yabn Rasulillah, you were killed while thirsty. They didn't cut your head in one go, thirteen strikes on the neck of Abi Abdullah. Sajjad would cry over and over thirty-five years, but there was one place that made Sajjad cry more than any other. There was one place that haunted Sajjad for all his life post Karbala. When they came to him and said, Imam, where was the most amount of difficulty? Where was the most amount of dhulm done upon you? Was it in Karbala or was it in Kufa? Imam would turn to them and say, No, Asham, Asham, Asham. No, it was definitely in Sham, Sham. Nu'man ibn Manzar al Madain, he comes to the Imam and says, Ya Imam, what is it that happened in Sham that you constantly remember this Sham? Says Nu'man, Sham is that place that when we reached there, they took the heads of our loved ones and they placed each head in front of the ladies that were associated to that head. They placed the head of Abbas in front of Umm Kulthum. They placed the head of Ali Akbar in front of Layla. They placed the head of Qasim in front of Farwa. They placed the head of Abi Abdullah in front of Zainab. These women would look up towards the heads and cry. Says Sajjah and Nu'man. There would be times when these individuals holding the spears would hit their heads together playing. And at times the heads would fall to the ground and be crushed under the feet of the camels or the hooves of the horses. Uh, Nu'man, the second reason is that in Sham, when we reach Sham, they hire drummers and dancers to dance around the daughters of Ali and Zahra. Nu'man, the third reason is that they appointed an announcer that would stand by our women and every street that they walked through, he would would announce that these are the ones that did rebellion against Yazid. Come and take your revenge from them. Nu'man, the next reason is that the women of Sham, they all went on the roofs of their homes and they would stone the daughters of Ali and Zahra. Nu'man, they would set fire to wood and throw it upon us. Nu'man, they would take boiling water and pour it upon us. Nu'man, the next reason is they took us to the area of the Jews and the Christians. There they announced that these are the ones whose forefathers killed your forefathers in Khaybar and Khandak. Come and take your revenge. Each of them came out with things in their hands and they began to beat the daughters of Ali and Zahra. The next reason Nu'man is, is in the Sham. They took us to the slave market where they tried to sell the daughters of Ali and Zahra as slaves. Had it not been for the divine intervention, are they would that saved us on that day? The next reason, Nu'man, is that they kept us in that house of ruins, imprisoned, in that place where it had no roof, so our children would suffer under the heat of the sun, and they would shiver under the cold of the night. Every time the wind would blow, the walls would begin to move. The children would be terrified. Sir Nu'man, these are the reasons why I say Asham, Asham, Asham. Allah, 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 Allah,
Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins. Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive the sins of our parents. Ya Allah, those of our parents that are alive, give them long lives. Those of our parents that have left this world, give them place next to Ali Muhammad in Jannah. Ya Allah, those who are ill, give them shifa. Those who are in debt, clear their debts. Those who are in education, make them successful. Ya Allah, keep safe the Shia of Ali Muhammad around the world. Ya Allah, Allow us to go on the ziyarat of Allah Abdullah and all the Aima this year and every year. Ya Allah, allow us to see Jannatul Baqi built within our lifetime. Ya Allah, destroy the enemies of Tashayyo, both internal and external. Ya Allah, keep safe the Maraja and our ulama and keep them at the head of our institutions. Ya Allah, hasten the reappearance of the Imam of our time and allow us to be amongst his true Muntadirin, his true waiters. The acceptance of these du'as and any other du'as that you brothers and sisters have brought on this night. Whatever in the world you may be, please recite your loudest salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah, Assalamu alayka ya Ibn Rasulullah.